Hi everyone, this is Julie Roth Novak. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Party Slate. I hope you guys appreciate my new step and repeat I have behind me. Um, it's an upgrade from my ugly um, living room. So glad to have you all here with me. Um, today, we are gonna talk about the new world of virtual events, taking them to the next level, thinking about integrating physical and virtual experiences in hybrid events. And I'm so pleased to have a rock star panel of virtual event experts and event experts overall uh, from Blueprint Studios. We've been working with you guys, I think, for a couple of years. And I went to your launch party, your studio party in San Francisco. I, I, I was blown away. I'm like, this is like I, so incredible. Um, so thank you for including me in that amazing party in the old days when we could all get together. I miss those days. Um, but I'm gonna just do a quick introduction. Also, we'd love to hear where you guys are zooming in from, uh, from across the country. So if you don't mind, um, share your chat to all panelists and attendees um, so we can see where you're zooming in from. I think our last one, we had people from Europe, from South America, from all over the US. So that's really exciting. Cause again, I like to pretend this is my TV show. So thank you <laughs> for joining us. Um, I have with Arizona, yay. I have with us today, Pamela Rothbard, who is our editor. And Pamela is going to be um, taking questions throughout, so we want to keep this really interactive. And then I just want to really quickly do an introduction or have the Blueprint um, virtual experts introduce themselves, um, just to give you a little context of who they are and their um, background. So maybe I'll start with you, Dominic. Tell us a little bit about your background and how you got started in the events world um, and where you are based. Perfect, yeah. So based out of Southern California, um, our LA office, currently uh, in our Vegas office just here for the day, just visiting as well. And to your question of how I got started um, in the events industry, um, that could be a long story, but I'll keep it short. So in essence, um, I spent about 11 years in the cruise industry, uh, managing everything from hospitality, onboard revenue to charter sales. Um, did that for about 11 years. And the fun things about doing that at sea is once you're at sea, you have to work with what you have, right? You, you can't kind of bring in an additional truck. Um, Fell in love with an American woman and moved to the States. Um, and then kind of jumped straight back into the crazy world of events in the LA market, having the ability to work with one of the largest um, rental companies there for several years. Um, had the pleasure to join the Blueprint Studios team a little over a year ago, um, so I could dive much more into the creative side outside of just the rental side of things. But yeah, had, had the pleasure of being a part of some of the biggest corporate events and social events um, that happen within the US. And uh, yeah, very, very uh, blessed and lucky to kind of be where I sit today. Awesome. Uh, Lily, let's go to you next. Quick, quick Hi. background and intro. Great, thanks. Hi. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Lily Young. I'm the director of sales at Blueprint Studios. I've been here about four and a half years. Um, prior to that, I actually started in the entertainment industry in LA. I was there for about eight years at NBC Universal doing uh, production as well as part of the finance team. Uh, from there, I moved to the Bay Area and then that's really what started uh, more of the events industry with me. Um, I ended up building a satellite office for a premium linen rental company um, and working with business development marketing there and then moved to Blueprint Studios. Um, today, I'm in, in the Bay Area station, but today I'm actually at uh, the Chase Center where uh, the Warriors uh, home is, and we're doing a photo shoot today here uh, to help them with marketing efforts for next year. So uh, thanks so much for having us on. Glad, glad to have you. Uh, last but not least, Camilla. Hello everyone, thank you for joining us. Um, I'm Camilla and uh, I uh, have been with Blueprint Studios for about gonna be 13 years now. Um, to your question of how I got into events, um, I think that like a lot of the people that come from creative fields, like from Academy, uh, by chance. This is not a career that they teach you. This is not something that anyone tells you exists, really. When you yes. come from uh, graphic design, advertising, industrial design, like interior design, anything like that, you kind of bump into the events industry. Someday that you come to an event and you're like, oh, I could do this. Mm -hmm. And then you get into it. Um, and that's kind of how it happened to me. I come from, I'm in, um, an art director. I I uh, went to grad school in San Francisco for at the Academy of, uh, at the Academy of Art University uh, for advertising and ended up uh, working at Blueprint Studios in San Francisco for about seven years and then moved to open the location in uh, LA and uh, was there for about you know three and a half years and then have been here almost two, two years now in the Las Vegas location. 
Awesome. Well, we're so glad to have you. You guys have such um, unique experiences and bringing it all together with virtual events is really what I'm excited to talk about today. So really quickly for context setting, um, I'm going to really quickly share my screen and walk through and now, okay, see, this is a good example of contingency plan. Let me go back here. <laughs> this is what I said not to do on your virtual event. So don't watch this. <laughs> um, but just to do a quick set, uh, lamp, you know, kind of setting, context setting for virtual events. We have found that putting on virtual events is much more like running a TV show, a TV production, than it is um, an actual event. There's new skill sets required. Um, you really need to think through contingency plan. You need to think about so many different things. Are you pre-recording? Are you not? And what we've really tried to do at Party Slate, for those of you who are new, is in addition to providing a place where people can get inspired, find new ideas, we have over 900,000 photos from all over um, the country that are posted by leading event professionals, is provide virtual event resources. So you know, what you need to do, we have a checklist, we have a landing page, we will send this as a follow-up. There's so many things that you need to think about um, that are really important. And today we're gonna talk about how you can really think about really taking your virtual experiences and combining them with um, live in-person um, components. And another way to think about it is when the world is fully open again, I believe, and I know you guys believe, that there'll be a virtual component moving forward that will allow people to experience the event without actually um, being there. And so our focus today is gonna be on corporate, but many of the things you're gonna be talking about really do apply for other types of large scale fundraisers and other types of events um, as well. So I'm gonna jump right in um, to the panel um, conversation and please, please ask questions. Um, because we want to make this very interactive and I'm excited they're going to show some demos and and really give some real real world um, use cases. So number one, um, Dominic, I'll start with you. The, the pandemic hit, you know, March and April, we're like, oh my God, the world has changed very quickly. Um, and I know you guys very early on, um, especially with your large scale corporate clients, really started to think about um, how can we continue to have really meaningful experiences through virtual events. So tell us a little bit about your journey when the pandemic first hit and how you thought about virtual events. Yeah, that's a great question, Julie. Good one to kick us off on. Um, I think what's really interesting, and I'd said at the beginning in my intro that I joined Blueprint Studios about a year ago. And when I was looking at joining the company, I was having conversations with um, Blueprint Studios ownership and they were already starting to talk about there was a need to get more tech savvy, more immersive, and there was this trend of hybrid events being part of the future. Yes. Um, as an organization, Blueprint was already doing so much for a lot of their clients already when it comes down to kind of creating and showcasing content within their events. And to be honest with you, that was something that drew me to the organization and chose to make my shift to become a part of the team. What was very interesting when March came along and the pandemic hit was the initial plan was to launch, we were actually gonna go ahead and create, or we were creating Studio A, which was gonna be our creative services studio. Um, the plan of that was to launch it in kind of summer, late summer of um, 2020. However, the pandemic hit, and as you're very aware, um, that expedited that process significantly for us, right? Because the, the need was now, yeah. right? Um, so we jumped in really quickly. But as an organization, we'd already seen that movement and that need. Yeah, you guys are based in San Francisco in the Bay Area with you know the headquarters for all tech companies. So I can imagine even in, in advance of the pandemic, you were already okay. using a lot of technology. Yeah, so I think, I think for us, so a lot of people on this call would be familiar with the trade show TSC and Cater Source that was actually happening um, in the Las Vegas marketplace during March. It was really when the pandemic hit. It was, it was probably the last main conference within Las Vegas. Um, before the pandemic hit. And for us, we were on the trade show floor, we had our trade show booth, and instantaneously the attendance dropped to about 30, 40% of that event, as everyone was aware of because of the pandemic and people didn't want to travel, feel comfortable to travel, needed more information before they traveled. So very quickly we looked to how do we take the physical experience and take it virtual, but also being able to create that hybrid world where those two audiences would be able to interact. And I think, Camila, that really segues in perfectly um, to one of the first things that you and I talked about showcasing today was actually that, that Blueprint Studios booth and how we went ahead and took that, that virtual. Um, yeah. Do you booth, Camila? Yeah, Camila, it would be great if you could walk us through, in addition to that demo, 
the storytelling kind of aspect of, of virtual events and how, you know, it's not just like, hey, show up. It's actually, you know, getting people to experience your brand or experience um, the event in, in, in a more um, tactile way. Yes, so, so the most important thing when we were looking into how are we gonna create, how do we find a way to create the same experiences that we are able already to create in the live event? But in the virtual event, we realized that our challenge for the longest time had been, let's create a live event that is super tech savvy. How do we make it more tech savvy? How do we make it more technology driven? How do we do this so that it's futuristic looking? And then we realized that we're in this world that is completely futuristic all of a sudden that is virtual, that is technology driven, and that we need to make them more alive. We need to now think about this the opposite way. How do we make it a lot more alive? And we realized that within our digital um, and creative services that we had already been offering to our clients, we had the tool to be able to do that. And to that point, when Dominique was talking about RTC booth, uh, what exactly happened is like we immediately had the need to let's build this same experience um, uh, digital. I'll show you how that happened and how I actually joined this okay. meeting today. But um, I think that the main thing about this storytelling is really that both in the live event and in the digital event, there is definitely a need to tell that story. And when the, when the whole pandemic happened, most of, um, uh, most of the people in the industry were just literally thinking, how do we deliver content? We need to deliver all this content. We need to create these conferences. And there are a lot of platforms out there, a lot of them, these are not new, right? So there's a lot of platforms that you can find that deliver that content that for years have been developing the technology to deliver content and do it amazingly. Um, so people went to those and started delivering content. And then there was exhaustion of delivering content. Mm -hmm. And then there's exhaustion of like communicating only and not having any experience. So we do approach and we decided that our approach was gonna be from the storytelling, from the conceptualizing, from the building and attendee journey, developing floor plans, developing renderings, doing it just like we do it for the live event. And then two scales so that we could bring a path back to a live or a hybrid event if our client wanted to, or we were right in the moment where a pandemic is, you know, at a point where we can actually go back to some sort of a live event. Um, so basically, I'm going to show you a little bit of how that would work from our world. Um, I'm going to share my screen right now um, and show you. Can you see my screen right now? Yes, we can. Great. So this um, space that you're um, seeing right now is um, our TC booth. Um, like we were explaining when the pandemic hit, we basically had 50% people who were that had RSVP to come to our demo, to our um, booth to demo, um, they canceled, they could not come. So we decided to recreate the experience virtually for them. We took our floor plans, we took our renderings that we had already uh, used for technical uh, development of the virtual, of the uh, live event, and we built our virtual experience. And this is what it looks like. If you see it's a 360 experience completely, and uh, it allows you to embed uh, different functionalities. But the way that I join the meeting today I'm in this space, um, and this space looks exactly the same as the space that Dominic is in right now. I clicked here um, on this link, and it immediately pops my Zoom meeting. So and I'm not gonna be able to- You are able to connect with people that make, makes them feel like they're in that experience. Correct. So I am literally virtually in the same exact space that Dominic is at live right now. And I am communicating through this virtual space that looks the same, we're experiencing exactly the same, but right now I'm actually able to connect with him through my virtual space. So I'm actually connecting two people, two people, not just delivering content to them separately. They are both in different places, but say, visually the same. I'm gonna close this because I cannot join because I already joined. Yes. Um, and I'm gonna pass it to Dominic so that he can show you where he's at. Yeah, so thanks, Camila. So I think what's really powerful that Camila just shared there, and I know one of the topics for today's conversation was as people start to be able to come together again, right? As we start to be able to come together in 20, 30, 40% capacity if we were before, how do we start to bring that virtual audience together with the live audience? So as Camila mentioned, I'm actually in our showroom in Vegas right now, and the booth that we'd gone ahead and created for TSC is actually now 
constructed in our showroom. But the really powerful thing that you're gonna to get to see now is the whole premise behind these experiences is if it's a trade show, if it's an expo, or if it is an activation, is when Camila actually came in today and she joined the meeting, within the monitors and the screens that you see that now live, and let me step away so everyone can see it, live within this booth, you would actually have the ability to interact with Camila so she feels like she's part of the event, right? So much the same as we'd said before, how do we bring that virtual audience and give them the ability to connect with the physical audience? This is in essence one way of how you do it. So now if we were to go ahead and have this booth and have it exposed at a trade show, we would physically be able to bring in that virtual audience and go ahead and interact with them, have meetings with them much the same as we would if they were there in the live. Now I know in a minute Camila's gonna walk you through some of the functionality, but just to show you within this booth as well, everywhere from the table seating to the monitors that we have behind us, Right now, this was actually where we had all of our flip books and all of our brochures when this was live on the trade show floor. But what you'll be able to see momentarily is how my user experience in the live is so similar to the experience that Camille is able to have within that virtual world. And rather than it feeling like there's two separate events happening, you're able to bring those audiences together so they have the ability to connect. Again, I'm showing us that as an example within a trade show booth but you can go ahead and roll that out to social events, right? Into conferences, into trade shows, anything yeah. it may be to bring those audiences together. Yeah, I think that just thinking about, you know, the applications to, you know, again, fundraisers, galas, so many different events that even when the world does open back up, if people can't come, but they still want to be, they're connected to the cause, they, or it's a product launch or whatever, that they can feel like they're there um, and not just be staring at us, you know, in the old days of virtual, it's just like, oh, it's streaming. And it's like the yeah. stage and someone's streaming. That's, that's not what we're talking about. Also, I'm going to actually, um, let me turn it over to you. Should I turn it over to Camilla or Lily to kind of walk through the user experience? So I'm, I'm going to uh, real quick on the demo, share my screen um, again yep. so that I can show you a few of the things uh, that are okay. possible. Okay. Um, so when I come in, the first thing that we see is a navigation tool that tells us how to navigate the space. Everything that you see on the, on the floor, basically, that is horizontal is um, areas on how to navigate. Everything that is vertical is where you can find content. So if you can see this at any point, you can embed each different event kinds each of video options. Yep. Um, like we saw before, different, um, it, it, you can embed the different communication tools like a Zoom meeting. Or we have you know, a native solution as well. Um, gamification opportunities. So this is, for example, whiteboard. Um, and when you come in, you get to explore it. You can invite people to do it with you. Um, and you can just like um, start your, your exploration together. I'm trying to... Hold on. I think it just click on it again and it comes... It disappears bear with me <laughs> that's okay i think Julie, Bill, it's doing that something you'd, you'd mentioned this as we were segueing over a minute ago something that's really interesting within the virtual hybrid world that we found ourselves in again that was expedited because of the pandemic is it enables us to be so much more inclusive and you mentioned at the beginning within these webinars right you're, you're able to have people attending from not just around the united states but internationally as well and i think Something we're finding is we're having the privilege of kind of creating and executing these hybrid and virtual events is they're so much more inclusive because people yeah. who maybe normally wouldn't have the ability to hop on a plane and travel there have the ability to not only attend the event, but to interact as if yeah. they were a live attendee as well. And Dominic, that kind of leads me to my, my next question of, you know, keeping people engaged. So let's say you get people there. And again, their, their attention span is low and there's, you know, they got kids at home, they got a dog, you know, how do you, how do you keep them engaged? I know you guys have done some kind of fun things to keep people engaged. Yeah. So gamification, that seems to be the new buzzword right now, right? A lot of people talk about gamification. What we've really found is creating ways to engage with your audience prior to the event. So be that creating polls, um, questionnaires, surveys, different things so they can become a part of that event and feel engaged. What that enables them to is when they attend the event, they're waiting for that moment, right? When you're gonna go ahead and re release the result of that survey, release the result of that poll as well. So one thing we found within these events is not just the event itself, but really telling that story up to weeks or months prior to the event to pre-engage your audience, yes. but then also having a strategy post-event as well to go ahead and engage their audience. 
Another thing that I think we found is when you're doing a corporate event or a trade show or expo, right, within the live world that we lived, there's so much else that normally happens outside of that, right? You have welcome dinners and parties, you have cocktail parties, you have evening performances as well. And something we found is bringing that level of entertainment and connectivity into those corporate style trade shows and events as well, just gives people another opportunity to interact and connect. Yeah. Um, I would love to go ahead and bring something up and show you. Yeah, just I was going to say, I'd love to uh, show the amusement park um, demo because I thought that was really fun. And, you know, when you think about these big corporate events or even conferences, there's usually an opening party. There's a closing night party. And I happen to be one that like those opening and closing parties. Um, so, I, you know, those are the type of things where there's just something a little bit more fun than speakers or, you know, an expo um, where people can really engage. Yeah, and I, I feel like the two things we always say on Zoom, right? Can you see my screen and on your own mute? So I yeah. want to, now everyone can see my screen, right? Yes. Perfect. So um, the page we're on now is actually a, a sample of a multitude of different projects that we've had a pleasure of being a part of creating. Because you mentioned it, Julie, I'll go ahead and drop in yeah. to the amusement park now. One thing that we created from a solution perspective is we actually created two different types of virtual experience, two different types of options. So we created a VEP, uh, which is our virtual event platform. Mm -hmm. And the way I want you to think of that is that is your digital venue in yeah. which it houses all of your activity from main stages, presentations, marketing, agendas. And then we also created VESs, which are similar to the Blueprint Studios booth, but these are fully immersive 360 degree worlds that you get to get into. Now, what you're seeing now is a, a sample of the VEP, the platform um, of our amusement park world. So from where your user would log in and register to have the ability to come into the platform to where you'd have a welcome video, main stage presentations, where you have the ability to have everything from pre-recorded, simulated live to live content coming in. You'd have your program so they could see the run of show for the evening. So Julie, as you mentioned, right, if there's a dinner, if there's some kind of social meeting, if there's some kind of suites or breakout activities, yeah. if there's a presentation, an auction, that would all be listed there as well. The nice thing you'll see within these platforms is they're one scrolling page. Mm -hmm. So if you're on a smartphone, if you're on a tablet, if you're on a desktop, you're not having to get lost in a world of multiple tabs, right? Mm -hmm. It's a clean user experience. The piece I want to show you, and this isn't a live platform that I'm showing you, would actually be the VES. So this is a sample of that fully immersive world that the user would actually have the experience to get into. And I'm gonna show you a little video of what that feels like right now. So as you can see, they would be able to enter into the park. Once they open it up originally, they have instructions. So it kind of lets them know how to navigate and lets them know what to do within that amusement park. You have a map function that was just brought up there. So at any time people can see what's happening, where they need to go. The nice thing is within these amusement parks and within these VESs is they all become customizable. Yeah. So as you move around the space, you'll see a multitude of hotspots where we have everything from embedded video, but it could quite as easily be a link to a VIP webinar. Um, it could be some form of gamification. You really have the ability to go ahead and build that out. But you can see from an aesthetics point of view, they're an enjoyable space to spend time. We actually tend to find that when people are in these fully immersive worlds as well, they become very competitive, right? And we're talking about grown adults, but Julie, I might be here. Just, hey, Julie, I'm at the duck shooting contest. Come, come and join me and see if you can beat my high score, right? So people really do come in and start to enjoy these worlds as they navigate around. I love and they have like recipes and different things. I'm, I'm assuming you could have a mixologist doing you know, drinks yeah. or whatever at the bar. Mm -hmm. Um, this is just, again, a right. hundred times more engaging than your standard Zoom. And we know that every event won't have kind of a budget to do these type of things. But when you're talking about a large scale corporate or a fundraiser where money is, you know, very important to either raising money or selling product or whatever it is, taking these experiences to the next level, a huge difference, a big difference. Yeah. And, and, and Julie, sorry, uh, go ahead. 
Oh, no, no. I was just going to mention you you mentioning that, Julie. It's it's really great that um, we, we also recognize that the user experience is completely different. So we have various recipes for different people. So if you are trying to fundraise and donate versus your a corporate client versus your just uh, your employee, you're part of the employee engagement team at your company and you're trying to connect in different ways, we our recipes kind of make sense based on what your needs are and your goals and objectives are for that specific, you know, event. I love it. And Lily, I know um, we talked kind of in the green room before about the advantages of integrating kind of a physical event with a virtual event. Mm -hmm. You know, we call that kind of a hybrid event, which we again, yeah. see more and more of. Even like the Zoom weddings are starting to be, oh, now there's 20 people in person and then it's right. Zoom the rest. So we're seeing that even on a smaller scale. How are you guys thinking about that, that opportunity? Yeah, there, I mean, it's, it's great. You know, we obviously want live to come back, but just seeing how um, amazing some of the pros are obviously for virtual and mirroring the two is yes. really good to be dynamic, you know, and I think even Dominic and Camilla mm -hmm. mentioned this, like the first thing is really uh, like audience reach in virtual, you are really going to reach uh, like virtually anywhere, <laughs> you know, people being able to come to your platform or your like virtual exploration space and experience that together, you know, and I think that's, that was very difficult before because you might have had, you know, venue restrictions or again, travel restrictions and other things. Um, you know, I definitely think the other, the other thing in virtual that's fantastic is this whole on demand piece. So, you know, before you couldn't really go into two conferences or two, you know, breakout meetings, you know, two fireside chats all at the same time, you kind of had to choose which yeah. one you wanted to see. And now you can go to one and then on demand, see the other. So mm -hmm. I think that piece is amazing. Um, and then Camilla actually mentioned a really good one, which on our side, we've already thought all about that in terms of like saving people money and making sure nobody over, ex you know, extends their expenses. The creative team at Blueprint, we've definitely created all the asset uh, assets to scale so that if it does in turn go to a live event, if you need to pivot to a hybrid where you want that live component with the virtual, we're able to use all those assets and you're not spending all of those, that money and time again. You to can reuse it over and over right. again. It's exactly, almost like building exactly. an asset, a marketing asset or, you know, for right. your company. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And, and Dominic, a question for you, anyone can answer this. Yeah. We've gone back and forth on like, how long can these events be, right? To keep attention. So we did a kind of premium member summit. It was 90 minutes. Again, we didn't have your fancy amusement park. Next time <laughs> we will. But, you know, even 90 minutes felt a little bit long because of attention span. So what, what are you guys seeing as far as length of time? I know it probably depends what the purpose of the event is, but what, what are you guys seeing on your side? Yeah, and I think to kick that off, we're doing events from 60 minutes to several days, right? Yeah. And it really depends on what is the message, right? What is the outcome you're trying to create and you're trying to generate as well? And the nice thing within these virtual worlds, and Lily kind of touched on a little bit, is people do have the ability to come and go and, yes. move around, and move around freely as well. So within that agenda, someone might attend a presentation or a webinar or a lunch and learn, right? And then they might go run groceries and do something else and then they'll come back in and re-engage and re-interact with the platform as well. So again, it, it really depends on the event and what you're trying to create. Yes. Um, <clears throat> and that's actually, I, a good, actually right. segue Camilla on, I, I skipped over this, but how, you know, how do you think about pre-recording segments? So like you said, Dominic, you can come back and experience it um, anytime versus the live presentation. There is something more, exciting about live, but I also know a lot can go wrong with live. Um, so Camilla, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I mean, absolutely, absolutely everyone prepares live, but that is not the best technical option. Yeah. So live does give you that kick of like, oh, I'm going to miss it. I need to run. It's exciting. When you're talking live, the adrenaline is different. So that definitely creates this event type of excitement that pre-recorded wouldn't necessarily. But as an event planner, if you're the person producing and what you want is your production to go flawless, the safest way to go is pre-recorded. And there are ways in which you can pre-record and simulate live. And that is something that is, is very used um, these days because it allows for the attendee to still have that sense of, uh, of, of urgency of I have to go, I have to be there. It's, you know, it's at this time, I'm not gonna miss it. I don't wanna miss it. Um, but it does give production skill sets that are 
way superior than when you're in the live event. The main reason why is because live streaming will always have lag. There is a latency that is inevitable. Yes. Um, depending on the software that you have, depending on what type of OBS you're using, depending on what is the, the type of um, technical production that you have set up, um, that latency or that lag is going to be, you know, higher or lower, but it's always going to be anywhere between three seconds to 20 seconds in some cases. So you are definitely not going to be 100%, you know, flawless when you're doing live. Yeah. And so how do you plan for those technical kind of difficulties? How do you prepare? I don't know, Lily, if you want to answer this one. And how, how do you think through um, scenario planning? Um, part of it could be pre-recording, but, you know, like right. you said, live is more engaging many cases. Uh, how right. do you prepare for that? No, that's, that's such a great question. You know, definitely uh, the way that everyone prepares for a live is going to be completely different than you would for a virtual. And one of the big components is really keeping a dedicated like timeline and deadline, you know, piece on our end, because we do structure um, the way that we like process a virtual event in different segments. Um, two of the segments that are closer to the end are really important, which are uh, testing phases. So we do an internal two week testing internally uh, where we have a, a whole uh, QA team that just really checks every, th every functionality of the space, all the coding, et cetera. Uh, from there, we then do another two week testing that's on the external uh, server portion and that's with uh, the client the client engagement as well and we, we test with AV everything else you need in terms of the streaming as you mentioned um, and then you know honestly I think the biggest thing too is um, a help desk that's actually for the event itself is really really pivotal and important so we do have um, we do take care of that on our end as well depending on the number of attendees are there we have um, a set group of very uh, experienced help desk professionals that will help support right. um, and then the it's great like thing a little, it's like having a geek squad you know right yeah kind of. <laughs> I don't want to say they're geeks kind of. like, no no I need yeah. to answer questions like when my mom can't get into the zoom I have to like walk her through yes. how like, to get on volume's like, not working yeah, yeah. Yeah, I can. So yeah, in the, the, in the production back end is pretty much like in the live event. We do have a Zoom meeting or a meeting where everyone is in the production side. The help desk is in their production side. Like yes, everyone yeah. has its own moment where um, right. it's being, you know, it's being monitored and produced at the, as it is happening. Mm -hmm. um, I think, and I'm gonna, I don't know, Lily, if you have more. I, I'm gonna step on a little bit just yeah. to, want to mention that on the production aspect of it, on the back end of it. There's always this um, security that we have that when we are producing an event, we do it in stages. And those stages are always recorded, meaning that there is memory of every single step of the way through production. Yeah. The last version that you had, keeps a, we keep a memory of that. So if for mm -hmm. any reason something happened, which shouldn't, but if for any reason anything happens, um, there's always an opportunity for that latest version to to just like come in and be there. There should not be moments in which we do have lack of information, lack of the right. like it shut down and and, and and what do we do now? It's um, kind of like you have redundancies, like so something not to sound geeky, but if a server goes down, something else is ready to go. So it's not a blank. You don't go dark, so to right. speak. Yes. Correct. Our our team, our help desk um, is divided between developers and also customer service people. So our developers are always on yes. when we are on a live event. And so we, we talked uh, about these larger scale kind of productions where this makes a lot of sense. There's bigger budgets. How do people decide whether they're going to do kind of a homegrown, you know, Zoom is good enough or really step it up to create these really immersive, you know, experiences? I mean, I think that there are a lot of things that define that. Um, and we all know that one of them is budget. Yeah. You know, it, it definitely that's one of the de de definitions of, you know, am I going to use a technology that is, that is more or less expensive? But then in, if, the, if money is not an issue, if we're talking about more of what is the experience that I want, I think that there are various different options. Um, now we actually at Wilkins uh, have developed three different platforms that um, cater to different types of events. Yeah. Uh, we created a platform that caters to social and nonprofit events and it has a lower budget type of uh, opportunity for these events because we understand the, that industry very well. Um, we have another opportunity that gives you the option to embed the VESs, the exploration spaces as well, that creates a little bit of a higher end event, but it is still a simple enough platform so that someone could do an event in a medium, you know, size range. 
and then we do have our large conference, uh, very large conference uh, platform that is a lot more complex, I would say, in terms of the functionalities that it has. It offers chat opportunities, video chat opportunities, but most importantly, it offers networking opportunities within the platform that allow you to actually decide who are the people that you want to connect with. So what we have seen today so far is in what we've, we're going to see in a little bit, um, a little bit more of, um, is our medium sized platform that offers, um, you know, like it caters to the, the, you still have a budget that is healthy enough to be able to do an immersive space uh, with some functionalities, but it's not too complex. It's simple for the people that need to understand this is where I go and this is what I do because not everyone is used to this virtual world, right? Yes. Not everyone um, really knows how to navigate all of these different functionalities and different complexity, complex, you know, um, features. So, so what we are showing today is more on the medium size and we're happy to, to show I more think, complex options later on. Yeah, adding something to that really quickly, when you talked about kind of people planning out their event studio, I think something that's really interesting is, we mentioned this at the beginning as well, the virtual world really does open up that inclusivity, right? The ability for people to attend to maybe if you did an event that only housed 500, 5,000, 50,000, within that virtual platform, you really have an unlimited audience attendance. We've hosted events with 300 people, right? We can host events for several thousand people as well. And we had the ability to be a part of an award show that happened back in LA um, in September. And the amazing things was, was nominees and people who were part of the peer groups had the ability to interact and attend some of those celebratory events that they were attending from Asia, Australasia, Europe, and maybe yeah. they normally wouldn't have made the trip in. And we're even seeing with a lot of our social events as well that maybe before they would have had 800 people for their event, but they're, they're potentially having two, three, four thousand people because it becomes so much more accessible as well. Yes. So I would really say I anyone. Mean, our, our, our virtual events are a good example. So we have people from all over the world. We used to do mainly in-person. We still will do in-person launching new cities. And, and we, we so believe in the in-person, but to extend it with virtual, you know, it's just someone from Boston, Martha's Vineyard, North Carolina, uh, that, that normally if it was an in-person event, couldn't be there. So there is a silver lining to, we know people, I mean, my heart hurts for everyone that's in you know, struggling right now and his, you know we have one crisis after the other but some silver linings are you could actually get a broader an audience um, with these technologies um, but yet not give up the the in-person well, component when and i think open. people who so when the pandemic hit right a lot of people we were kind of waiting it out at the beginning and i think now people have that realization that if they want to connect with their audience, right? If they want to connect with their buyers, if they want to connect with their fan base, their donors, whatever it may be, virtual is what we have today. And I, I echo your sentiments of what you just said that we want to get back to live. But I do think that if you're doing that live event in Boston, right? Potentially, is there the ability to still have that virtual audience attend, right? There's people like me, if I have the, the, the ability to turn up and I'm in Boston, right? I'm right, I'm going to come in because after the event, I get to go grab sushi with you or go grab a glass of wine. Right? I don't get to do that through the virtual. But if I'm unable to be there, I still get to be present. I still get, get to, to be, be part of the experience. Yeah. yeah. And I think in our industry, you know, FOMO, fear of missing out is very real. Like, you know, oh, there's this, there's that you can't do everything, right? You just can't. And I know we talked earlier, we all, many of us have young kids. It's not possible, but if you could still participate in some way and see the key speakers. And I, I really think um, virtual is not going away. It's going to be another add-on or component of physical events. And I, I believe that for social gala corporate uh, uh, across the board. So again, silver lining is um, this will be a bigger reach than, than had you not had that um, component. Um, so one last question, and Pamela, do we have some questions from the audience? I'm yeah, sorry. I was just going to say, because we yeah. kind of talked around it a little bit, but like in terms of the planning, um, we know the roles and the um, order in which people hire when it comes to a regular in-person event, but what are the roles and in what order if you're a planner that's now going to plan an event that's going to have a hybrid element or is going to be completely virtual, where do you start? There, there's a lot of information that I can give you, that we can give you on that. But I think that one thing that is really important to, to remember um, and that we, we kind of like we were walking through this, you know, road and all of a sudden realized that this is the same road, only virtual type of thing. And I'm going to tell you why. 
when you're when you're uh, producing a or planning a live event, you you need teams. There are a few things that you need that you need that you know that you need. One of them is a good venue. You need to select your venue, understand what is the capacity and the functionality of your venue, right? We need to understand who's gonna be our production team. We need to understand who's gonna be our event management team. We need to understand what is gonna be our rental team. We, we need to understand our design team, all of those teams. When we started walking this road, we realized, well, you know what? We do actually need a very robust venue and that is a digital venue. That is a digital platform that hosts and houses everything. That's why we call it a digital venue. We also need to identify what are the functionalities and the capacities that it has and how it can let us you know, create this space. So one of those things is select a good venue for your event, whether it's live or, uh, or virtual. The second thing is, do I need within my venue, even if it's live, right? Do I, how many spaces do I need? Do I need breakout rooms? Do yeah. I need workshops? Do I need an expo space? Do I need a uh, registration space? Mm -hmm. so if I do, then on my live, on my virtual event, I'm gonna need a registration process, right? Registration, either software team integration, something that is gonna allow me to have the types of roles and the types of uh, security and privacy settings that I need. I need a login landing page that allows people to uh, gate, basically a good entrance. Then I do need to identify if I need an expo, then I need that expo space. In our world, that expo space normally would be, it can be two, two things, but normally what we would offer so that it's a more immersive space is a virtual exploration space, and we'll show you that in a little bit. Uh, but we could recreate an, exp an, an expo as well with creating you know, sponsorships and things like that within a platform that doesn't have a virtual exploration space as well. Yeah, I was gonna ask you about, like those. It was gonna ask you about, while you're talking about sponsors, if you could also mention, what are some ways to showcase sponsors for a corporate event or gala. I know I've done a lot of fundraising when I started Party Slate five years ago. I was doing a couple of large cancer research galas. I'm like, wait, how do I find new ideas? I couldn't find one. That's part of my kind of founding story. But sponsor management, that's how you make all of the donations is really sp big sponsors. The luncheons are great, the recurring donations, but sponsors are key. What have you found as a, as a good way to get those sponsors front and center? Yeah, so for sponsorships, there's this virtual world actually opened a huge door for sponsorships. Um, all of a sudden, our prospectuses for corporate events or our opportunities for sponsorship on, um, on, um, on nonprofit becomes unlimited. And the main reason why is because the virtual space is unlimited, right? Yeah. We basically have the opportunity to decide we're going to give a banner to this person, but guess what? That space for the banner and the live event is on a wall that's going to be super expensive to pull down, put back, you know, we cannot do that. But in the virtual space, a banner is actually sold by impressions, number of impressions, seconds, you know, viewers. So you actually can sell the same space several times to the same, to, to different sponsors. Um, you can create uh, website opportunities like those. You can create page opportunities. So if you are actually in a platform and you offer them the opportunity to have their own page within that platform, you, then they can have their own video, their own BS, virtual exploration spaces if, if they want to. They can have their own chat opportunity, a scheduler if they want to, uh, to create appointments. Um, now your opportunity of a list- It's, it's much richer than what you can yeah. create. And then, yeah. you, and then your perspective starts going down, right? Okay, my, my diamond la label level is gonna have all of these things. Now my gold is gonna have this minus this. Then my, this is gonna have this minus this. Same as in the live event, pretty much. And but then you have the follow-up opportunity as well for sponsors after. I think as well, just to jump in on there, Julie. So we're talking a lot about the user experience, right? And now we've segued into sponsors. The amazing thing is from a, if you're looking to put on a virtual event as a corporation or, or organization is, we have a lot of the analytics on the back end, right? Yeah. We get to see where people are going, how long they're spending time there, what they're clicking on. So the post marketing and the value of that information that you yeah. can take back to a sponsor yeah. and say, hey, not only are you, you platinum sponsor, but we're going to be able to let you know of potentially if that's something you've set up in your platform, the registered attendees, right? Who interacted with your sponsorship area? Who, who went ahead and clicked on your link as well? And, and that's something that we try to collect in the live, right? We have people with clickers and running around and asking questions. But in, in the virtual, we physically get to capture that information in real time, which is a really powerful tool for marketers to utilize post-event. That's great. 
We yeah. want to really quickly show you maybe, and Julie told us if this is a good time, uh, yes. to show um, one of our medium size on the, on the smaller size conferences, but this is how user friendly it can be. This is how we can actually incorporate all of these things that we've talked to you about in a uh, live experience. This was a conference that we did about three weeks ago for a chemical company. And uh, needless to say, we're showing this because we have the authorization from the company to actually show it today. Um, but this is how I would, let me just go in their space. You'll have to translate for us. Yeah, oh, and, yeah. the, and the reason why we have to translate is because <laughs> this company is a multinational. This event yeah. that we created was a conference for their LATAM um, uh, sales team. And they had about, six, it was initially going to be a 500 people event. During the event, we had 700 people showing up. And uh, it was actually uh, very interesting to see how they would work. Um, this is a company that um, did not have the opportunity to have an event ever before in the live events because chemical companies actually do not need to have events. They do really well, so they never have them. Their marketing dollars go, go elsewhere. And um, the CEO of this uh, Latin American area for this company came to, um, to our company and said, we are now for the first time in life going to have the opportunity to have all of our salespeople together in one place. And we want you to make it our city, our day of connection. We worked with them from the, from the communication aspect of it. it um, TAG, their company is Brand TAG. And TAG is a company, it means means day in German, in German and Spanish, from German to English is um, day. And connect, it was just the day of being connected, like finally after this pandemic, after all this. And um, what we saw here, the first, the first video that you see here right now is on demand, but it was their, um, their presentation, uh, live presentation, it was live streamed at the moment. Um, on the left side, they, when they came to us, they said, this needs to be like virtual events for dummies. We need this to look like a commercial website where people are going to know exactly where to go because otherwise they're going to get lost. Yeah. And uh, that's what we did. We created li literally a, the style of a commercial website that would be very branded to their, to their um, company and created it an agenda where they could just like uh, toggle up and down through the, day, through the two days with like the different... Um, sessions that they had. There was a uh, chat that you could join um, here uh, with, I, I'm not there, so I cannot join right now, but basically everyone who came in the platform was able to join and discuss things through the, through the uh, days of the event all of the time. We obviously provide all of these analytics, all of the chats, everything at the end. Um, and then the expo. So like we were talking before, we just went through our registration, we logged in, then we had our key uh, note or general session right here with the welcoming. Then we have an agenda, which is what we saw right here. And then we go to our expo. And the expo is an exploration space. And you see Whilst you're bringing that up, Camila, whilst you're opening that up, what's really interesting there, Julie and Camila, was, so this is an international company, right, that before hadn't had the ability to bring all of its employees together. However, virtual has always potentially been there as an option for people, right? It just, it maybe wasn't being created the way from a user experience perspective. But now I think, again, if there is a silver lining, it's opened so many people's eyes to what yeah. is possible, right? So these organizations, so I think what we're finding is not only is there the ability to recreate events that happened before in the, li in the live, but you're also seeing this wave of opportunity in the events world to bring people together who maybe didn't have the forum or the ability to gather before. So it's opening up new doors and new opportunity that weren't there. So right. a few things, um, let me first of all, see if my share is, um, is showing sound, which I don't think so. Let me share this. So this starts with the radio. The first thing that we wanted was for people to know that they could listen to the music while they were going around, because this needs to feel like a little bit of a party, right? We had three different options. Lower this. You're going to start a dance party in here in a minute. <laughs> yeah. She's with Julie's ready to go. And then their preferred one, which was number three. 
of them we stopped um, here in their case they had a video that they wanted everyone to watch before the thing started so now I am able to walk before that I was not able to see any of the tools so there was a little bit of a gate right there for everyone again if I want to pull up the radio at any time information navigation because I got I forgot about it uh, if I want to go full screen I can go full screen um, at any point um, this music, is really beautiful. music can come back at any point the map pulls up so this is how it is uh, designed this is what we were talking about before we designed this with a floor plan that is actually to scale in a certain space that has certain dimensions if Brentech came tomorrow and told us we want you to build this experience for us in the real life in this expo we would be able to do it because we have all the technical drawings we have all the floor plans we have absolutely everything that we you need have to do. you have the blueprint of the physical experience and for now it's virtual but when they're ready to go it could be their actual expo correct and it's already designed so literally 50 60 percent of the job is done and then how do you interact with the boot with the different areas so that's just the same kind of uh, zooming in and out of the different aisles well, yes. So in their case, for example, they had a uh, different, we created their CD, right? So all of these section right here is their sales uh, department. Um, so they look like houses. So I'll, I'll take you through it a little bit. This area was tech IT. So it looks yeah. a little bit techy. This was HR. So it looks like a um, Zen garden type of thing. This was, um, there's supply, supply chain. So it looks like uh, two containers. And then the center was where the main theater was happening for their executive meetings. The center here was their show of talent show, which was their expo, like after hours um, reception, uh, where they had diff 10 different meetings happening and there was dancing, salsa dancing. There was like uh, learning how to make arepas from Colombia. There was like how to, there was one that was uh, about uh, uh, cooking Mexican food in a spirit. Oh, so place. Julie, you mentioned at the beginning, right? Keeping people engaged. Yes. Within this world, within this environment, everything from yoga in the morning to get people up and stretching and active to different demos and presentations. So much the same as we'd break up a live event. It's not just webinar, presentation, 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 yes. back to back. You're, you're layering in those different experiences to keep mm -hmm. people really kind of immersed in part of the world. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's really amazing to see. And I know, Pamela, we have a few questions coming yeah. into the panel as well. I'll turn it over to you because we have about seven more minutes. So I want to make sure we answer a few questions and then we can do a wrap up. Yeah. Okay, sounds good. Um, can you talk about if you're able to incorporate e-commerce capabilities in a virtual event? So um, there, there are yes and no. So the platform per se, and this is true to most platforms, is um, we don't want to take care of the transactional aspect of it. Uh, we can embed, or we can, if the if the company that is being used, if the platform that is being used can be embeddable, we can integrate it, and we can also iframe it. So say you're using Shopify or Square or anything like that. You can view the products and you can actually uh, do the transaction through an iframe, but the monetary transaction is not happening in our platform. It would be happening in Shopify or, yes. or in um, Square, any of those. But it that looks is. like it's, it looks almost, it just pops up. It's almost like you're still within our it's platform, embedded. even though it's not correct. Yeah. Awesome. Um, um, okay. What's that, Julie? I was going to say, maybe we have two more questions and then I want to okay. actually loop back to the panel for some kind of learnings and insights on, on this new world we're living in. <laughs> um, okay, so speaking of new world, we do have a question about, are you seeing a rise for the need of like a virtual events manager that's a little bit more IT based um, and less operational? Um, yeah, look, I, th I think with the new virtual world that's coming, it is definitely creating um, a new mix within our team, right? And I think as, as there's a higher demand, there's a different level of project management. But as we know, anyone who's been a part of project managing or producing a live event, there's a similar skill set from a component point of view, right? Being able to manage multitude, a multitude of different projects as well. So, so I guess my, my short answer to that question would be yes. As, as the virtual world grows, there is a need for repurposing a lot of those skills that were within the marketplace before. And I think as we move kind of forward into 2020 and into 2021 and get back into hybrid, right, there's going to be a skill set and a need for people who know how to do both, right? So I would definitely recommend anyone who's out there who 
is looking for an opportunity or currently is an opportunity and is an event manager, take the opportunity to absorb as much information and become educated within this virtual forum. Because if I look into my crystal ball, there's going to be a need to bring back those event managers and project managers to virtual the hybrid, but there's going to be such a need for you to have an understanding and a skill set that, that sit within both worlds. Mm -hmm. I agree 100%. I, I even looking at Kylie, who runs our digital events, she was doing our physical events, right, full time. And all of a sudden, she's, I like to joke, she's my executive producer, like, you know, it, it jumping in there, the skills do translate, but there's also a learning curve. So get yourself, you know, educated. I also say, you know, volunteer to help on some of these and just, you know, shadow and learn. And I do think there's some really great career paths um, in, in, the, in this. So we actually, um, one thing that I want to say to that is that we realized early on when the pandemic started, like even before, it was a really interesting how it happened for us because um, a lot of our large conferences canceled right after, a little bit before and right after uh, the pandemic was declared global. And, um, and we realized early on that a big, a big, big, big part of our team that was going to be completely and absolutely valuable in the process of, of the virtual events was our creative team. I mean, everyone is valuable. I'm not saying that the other ones are not, but the creative team and the creative desk that had always been behind the scenes very much on like, you know, we're just, to, we're just getting things done and produced for the live events. Like the, the, the big kudos normally go to either, you know, the salesperson, the on-site production person, the, you know, everyone who's like the client face for it. But the, the creative team is always sitting there and just working. And uh, all of a sudden, they didn't kids and we're like, creative team did not move. We need to talk, kind of thing. It was like, these people that have been doing so much for us were, in many cases, the ones that were like, oh, this is easy. We can totally do that. We can absolutely do this. This is what we need to do. And yeah. we're like, oh my god, this is awesome. Yeah. Sometimes we didn't even know that, that, they were, that they were so knowledgeable in so many aspects. That's great. That's amazing. So I know we're, we're running out of time and I just want to make sure, number one, I just have to do a little bit of bragging um, about your beautiful uh, profile page um, that I, on Party Slate because you guys have some great information, um, not only in the, of the type of events you do, but also um, a stunning, stunning. I think you have 122 events that are absolutely beautiful. So I really encourage people to take a look at that. Um, the other thing to say is um, that we feel is really important is just, you know, exposing all the incredible event professionals that you guys work with to bring these events to life, which is shown on your profile page. Um, and then, of course, um, you can contact Blueprint if you guys have any questions. We'll send out all the follow-up information um, afterwards. But I just wanted to really brag for one second about your beautiful page. And then I will just say um, on our homepage, we have a link um, to all the different event types. Um, one thing we learned early on is you know, 95% of event professionals produce more than just weddings. You know, it's corporate, it's mitzvahs, but now we've added a virtual event hub as well. And companies like Blueprint and others that are experts in this area. And again, I will say, just hearing you guys in this demo is just like, I'm blown away. This is a great place to learn more about virtual events and to get um, more knowledge on the category. And of course, I encourage you to reach out to any of our panelists if you have any questions. So, yeah. Wanted to do a little bragging for you guys. <laughs> thank really, you. Really beautiful and thank you so much. And one thing I would add to anyone who's watching this live or watching it at a later date as well is a lot of what we've done over the last six, seven months is really educational for not only our clients, but people who are looking to do virtual events. And I think we approached virtual events from we want to go ahead and look at the user experience, the journey mapping, much the same as you would for a live event and then create the virtual and the solution. So I really encourage anyone watching to either reach out through Party Slate, reach out through blueprint.com. Please, we would be more than happy to dig into a separate side demo when we can really kind of roll up our sleeves and dive into not only solutions that we've created for other organizations and other events, but if someone has a project in mind coming up and they're like, how do I do it? What do I do, right? Um, would relish the opportunity to be problem solvers because I think 20 years of doing that in the live, right? That skill set and that hunger to create engaging solutions and experiences hasn't gone away. So please reach out and that, and that platform you just showed is a perfect forum for people to get in contact with us. 
Great. And then um, I'll say maybe each of our panelists, we could just share one insight, one nugget that you kind of have learned over the last six months. Um, I know you've done many of it done before the last six months to share um, with our audience. Maybe Lily, you could start yeah. any kind of insight or nugget about uh, I will yeah. I will see this new world. Yes, it existed before. I've been on Zoom for four years with venture capitalists in San Francisco, but it's yeah. massive right now. What, what, what are your thoughts, Lily? Uh, honestly, the biggest one that we, we're just coming across in general is just content, content, content. You know, I think all of us need live content and virtual content, but I think that what you're doing with that content is the time frame of what you're doing with it in a virtual versus live setting is just different. Like, you know, there's time to be able to switch out chairs or make changes on live events, but in virtual, you need that content way, way in advance. And so that's just something for all of you to think about when you're, when you're trying to plan these things out, the planning part on your end is going to be a lot more important pre-event versus, you know, before where you can make production schedules last minute. You can't do that anymore. You know, it's, it's way in advance. That's what I would just definitely say. Okay. So you can't do this in two days, guys, right? Yes. <laughs> um, no more changes. No changes. Yeah. Camilla, uh, how about you? Yeah, well, I would say that um, there's a there's a pretty famous word right now, and that is reinvent. And everyone's talking about reinvent. I would say not reinvent, but adapt. Uh, there's a lot to look into when uh, when the when, this is like non precedent. There's no precedent of anything like this, yeah. and it's it's forcing everyone to evolve, to do more, to recreate, to. So we don't need to reinvent us ourselves. We need to look into how do we adapt who we are, what we know how to do, how do we use these skill sets that we have in this new world? Um, because reinventing really is like, I don't know how much you can really reinvent in six months. You can really adapt and, and, and yes. recreate more of what you know. Yeah, we're not saying the word pivot, we're saying adapt, really adapt mm -hmm. is, is a great word. Dominic, any final thoughts and then we'll wrap up. Yeah, I would say, and again, much the same as I got on a plane this morning, right? I flew out to Vegas and I didn't think twice about taking my shoes off, taking my belt off as I went through security. So much the same as 9-11 changed the way we travel, right? And fundamentally, that's just become part of life. This pandemic has changed the world of events forever, right? The events yeah. world we all left six, seven months ago, it just doesn't exist anymore. So I think really echoing Lily and Camila's note of, the ability to reinvent and readapt to, again, this is me kind of jumping on my motivational high horse for a minute, but take it as an opportunity, yes. right? A lot of us got into the events world because by nature we're creative and we're problem solvers, right? Mm -hmm. They're the things that we love to do and all of that still exists within this new world. So reach out to us, we'd love to have those conversations, be a part of that solution because I do think there's something really exciting and it's different, right, mm -hmm. ahead of us. And I think it's going to be in these bite-sized stages, right? We're embracing virtual now. I feel like hybrid is here and right around the corner, right? And we're going to continue to evolve as well. So I would definitely, again, kind of say what I said to one of the questions earlier on. Take this time to educate, connect, reach out to people within the industry as well. Um, I feel like myself, I've been on such a learning experience over the last seven months. And every day I continue to learn and I'm blessed to have such an amazingly talented creative team around me. Um, but yeah, if you're sat at home waiting for what was January, February to come back again, right? The sooner you can realize that it's a whole new world, um, I think is really powerful for us all. That's great. Well, I just want to thank the, the Blueprint team. I'm just preparing for this and this webinar. I have learned so much from you, so thank you. Um, and I do think there's silver lining and a broader audience, more accountability, more interaction, great opportunity for sponsors. So I really appreciate you guys, not only showing the demos, but sharing your knowledge and, and what you've learned. Um, for, and thank you, Pamela, for helping me moderate. She's also my backup, just in case my thank Wi-Fi you. goes down. So just having Pamela there makes me feel better. So thank you, Pamela. Um, the one other thing I'll say is next week, we are going back to a little bit of our geeky digital marketing uh, workshops. And we are gonna be talking about website, website, websites how to increase your conversion, how to tell your story better. You guys know I've been doing websites for 25 years, that which makes me old. Um, and I have <laughs> a lot of passion for digital. Um, and I'm excited to have an incredible panel next week to talk about your website. So thank you again, Blueprint Studios. You guys are amazing. Um, Vegas, Los Angeles, and San Francisco joining us today. And uh, just appreciate all your thoughts and 
Can't thank you enough. We will send the recording to you after, and as always have a recap of our session. So thank you again until next week. We appreciate your time. Thank you, Julie. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.